And the next speaker that we're going to bring on this moment is Eddie Stone. He is the founder of Touchstone Essentials in 2012 with a vision of organic goodness accessible to everyone. Eddie knew that most supplements were anything but healthy. In fact, the vast majority had the same problems found in big food, pesticides, ultra processed ingredients, and toxic additives. Unable to find health supplements with organic, clean ingredients, he set out to create them, and Touchstone Essentials was born. As, a, as proud rebels with the cause, Eddie's company focuses on natural detox, CBD oil, organic superfoods, delivering the goodness of nature to over 60 countries and around the globe. And today's presentation is how toxic food is slowly poisoning you. And uh, I'm just going to bring Eddie on right now, and he can kind of explain what this means and go in his presentation. So, hey, Eddie, thanks for being here, brother. Hey, Neil, thank you so much for the chance to, uh, to be with you and to uh, uh, talk with your audience. I really appreciate the education and somebody being willing to dive into this subject that's so critical but doesn't get the kind of play that I, I think it should get. Exactly, yeah. So the, the events like this is just really grassroots movement where we're attempting to get it out because obviously the mainstream media, they should be picking up on these stories, but they're not, right? Yeah, no, they're caught up in their commercial interest and, you know, who pays their bills and all those uh, ultra processed food commercials they're dealing with. So I, you know, I, I think we got to advocate for ourselves and fight for this. Exactly. Well, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you so much. Go ahead and take it away. Okay, let me uh, flip over here and share a screen with everybody. Well, Neil, it's not sharing as rapidly as I want here. It's okay. Uh, it's telling me I've got to open up my preferences. Damn. Did you click the share button right in Zoom? I sure did. Yeah, we're having a little meltdown here. Uh, oh my goodness, Neil. So while, while Eddie's doing that, I'm going to go ahead and put the link in the room for this weekend, guys. Go ahead and take a look at that. All right, Neil, let's see. Uh, Is it not coming up? Go back to the room, click share, see what happens. My goodness. What do you see? It's locked. Oh, All right. Go. Yay, let's do it. I'm <laughs> so All right. my apologies. I've done this a lot, a lot of times in my life, but you wouldn't guess that. So uh, thanks for everybody's patience. So I'll I'm gonna focus on things that in my estimation, so for, for those that I don't know, uh, I've had the good fortune to be in this space for 30 uh, right at 30 years. And while we do produce products that we believe can assist people in this journey to, to maximize health, not just in this, you know, sort of moment you live in, but really uh, from a longevity standpoint, so that you, you don't just age, but you've got a body that would allow you to enjoy that. One of the, the challenges I see when I sort of look at our world at large, and for anybody listening that's had to take care of elderly parents or a brother or a sister, or you're basically around people that as they age, they almost become prisoners of their own body. You probably just sort of recognize these alarm bells that go off and you start thinking about, okay, you know, what can I do in the moment? But, but really those decisions and what we can do really start years, if not decades before. And so what I've prepared here is really sort of an approach that I've adopted, really sort of governs what we do as a company where uh, we start with awareness, right? So that you could be aware of your surroundings, um, do what you can to sort of minimize exposure to things that are detrimental to not just physically, like your bone structure, your muscles and things like that, but really also think about how these things impact your DNA and things all the way down to a cellular level, because that's really where this starts. So for us, the concept of toxins in food and you know, quite literally how they can slowly be poisoning you is, is something that I believe we've all got to be conscious of, right? And, and bearing in mind that it's not just 
yourself that you're thinking about or, you know, say decisions that you're making here and now. It's also that example that sets for family members, people in your community, because I, I do think as Neil was talking about in the beginning, we're not going to be able to rely on corporate America to do this because they can't monetize uh, this type of thing like they can say other commercial interests that they have. And so we've really got to, you know, fight for these uh, decisions ourselves. So for, for those that I don't know, um, I've been involved in health and nutrition uh, for 30 some years. I have to say it wasn't necessarily a career I, I thought when I was first getting out of school that I would get involved with. But what I found when really confronting personal health issues, uh, my mom years ago had an issue that turns out she had a toxicity problem that was negatively impacting her autoimmune disease. And for me, kind of these light bulbs went off and, you know, ultimately it was something that I wanted to pursue from a career standpoint because I felt like I could make a difference in this regard. And so it's been a long journey and I won't try to uh, wear out our time tonight talking about that. But we've got about 30 years of interest and 30 years of focus in health and nutrition. If you want to learn more about us, our website can provide you uh, uh, some of those details. And of course, there's maybe we'll have a chance to speak at another occasion about some of those other things. But let's, let's start here, the origins of toxic food and the image on the screen of, of sort of the the, the farm being sprayed is, is, is really probably not one that's too far from most people's minds. It's sort of what we think about, but farming today is as much a business of um, agriculture from historical things that we think of with tilling and plowing the land and, and taking care of it and planting the seeds. But now we have to think about it in terms of inputs, right? And farmers nearly have to have a chemical degree uh, to navigate these waters of, of what's happening, whether we're talking about seed or GMO seed or other chemicals that are sort of a part of this sort of modern uh, agricultural infrastructure that while it may uh, produce food and produce food cheaply, it doesn't necessarily produce food that's uh, serving us from a, a health standpoint. Uh, in the United States today, if that's where the bulk of our audience is coming from, you know, you would think with all the money we spend on healthcare, all the access we have uh, to um, agriculture, uh, food of plenty, uh, yet we're, we're not at the top of the chart from a longevity standpoint. We spend much more on healthcare and taking care of, our, uh, care of ourselves than other developed countries. And so there's some fundamental flaws in what we do. And, you know, for me, I think we can sort of start at the farm. And if there's a farmer listening, please don't take any of this personally, but we just look at sort of the, the practice as a whole and you can just look at the headlines. And so recently, this one grabbed me because I was really shocked where uh, city municipalities, uh, water treatment facilities, these days when they're treating water and sort of the bio sludge that uh, comes from that treatment when they're separating sort of the clean water supply, I say that in quotes, uh, versus what's remaining, there's now a practice where that's actually being sold to farms uh, to augment the um, topsoil uh, that they've got a problem with erosion. And unfortunately, uh, that sludge is toxic. And you can kind of think about when a municipal water supply, uh, you know, they're cleaning water, they're cleaning waste, you know, well, if, if they're separating off to the side, uh, the usable water, what remains can't possibly be safe. And yet, you know, we find it showing up in farmlands and so one of the things, you know, we'll talk about as we go through here about organic and the value of organic, even if we're not thinking about it in terms of perhaps uh, nutritional qualities being better with organic crops, we can just simply think about it from a safety standpoint, because any farm that is truly uh, USDA certified organic or one of the other quality certification services that are out there, one of the things we know is soil health, minimizing the exposure to toxins, heavy metals, environmental pollution, uh, and pollutants, uh, volatile organics, you know, it has to be limited or they're not going to be an organic farm. So issues like this where, you know, we've got a farm that literally is taking this sludge, this hazardous sludge from a municipal water supply and it's happening across the country and using it in, in the farm environment, you know, you're not gonna see that if you're in an environment where from a regulatory standpoint, that's prevented. So one of the things I'm conscious of when, when buying food or advocating, whether I'm talking about for my family or anybody that I'm near, is to just be 
conscious of these issues, right? And unfortunately, we live in a world where we can't take at face value, you know, what we're buying from a produce standpoint. If you eat meat, what you're buying from a meat standpoint, you really have to be aware, the old adage of buyer beware is probably never more important than it is today, given the separation between where things are grown, the process of transportation of getting that food to the grocery to make available. You know, in, in today's world, 80% of the population is living in urban areas that are separated by 100 miles or more from a farm that could actually supply that food. Well, if we're not close to the, to the food supply, the growing, uh, then our ability to keep up with it, understand what's happening and monitor it is, is greatly diminished, right? So we've got to rely on a lot of third party players in this process. And so a buyer beware, if, you want to, if you're taking any kind of notes, right, on sort of uh, tips that, that you can utilize to make sure what you're doing is, is good for you and your family, one of the things I tell you right up front is, don't just think about the, the label but try to pay attention to the sourcing. And there's a lot of groceries today that will actually tell you about the sourcing, right? They'll, they'll have placards up that this came from this farm or that farm, or at least you can look on the small identification that you find on a fruit or a vegetable or something that you're buying that may say at least what country of origin it's coming from. But we, we no longer can ignore the need if, if we're trying to optimize our health and longevity you know, we can no longer ignore the need to pay attention to the sourcing of food. But even still, you know, you can wind up situations like is, uh, and this article here, uh, this one actually caught my eye uh, because of the last name is Stone, my last name is Stone. I'm not related to these folks, but it caused me to really look at this. And this is a, a, a dairy farm where this family over the years began to realize that the rate of the cattle dying on the farm for no particular good reason was really higher than it had ever been at any point in their farm's history. And so when they brought out folks uh, to sort of test the soil, look at the water, look at the animals, do the blood work, and try to figure out what was going on, what they realized is that the, the soil, the feed, and the water, and then the grasses and the hay, the things that the cattle were exposed to and eating, were being polluted by PFOSs, which are what I refer to as forever chemicals. And I'll talk more about those a, a little later on in a, in, a, in a little more detail. But basically, uh, this pollutant was making it into the farms um, in eco environment. And so essentially, the cows they were raising and the milk that they were producing was no longer safe to consume. And then it turns out that actually the farmer and his wife, their chemicals were so high, so off the charts from what EPA standards would be that their own health was in danger. So here's a situation where no longer is this a working farm, though it's un unsafe, it's unsafe for the people that live on the farm and certainly no longer has any economic value for them. It's essentially uh, a hazardous waste site. And so this is unfortunately happening a heck of a lot more than any of us uh, want it to. So we have to be aware. And I understand that some of the other speakers are going to talk about glyphosate, uh, uh, which is uh, the, the commercial name is, is Roundup. It, it's interesting how it's, it's, it's another example to me where uh, the chemical industrial complex that's sort of a, a part of our lives. I mean, I think the sort of dirty little secret of modern, modern living is that there's some 80,000 chemicals out there, the vast majority of which have never been tested for their safety over a long-term period of time that are just pervasive in our society, right? We, we wouldn't have the smartphone or the LED TV or even our automobiles, they're so chemically made, right? All these vast and specialized chemicals. And yet a lot of them, a lot, lot of PFAS is where they're forever chemicals, right? They're not going where. Well, for my own observation, glyphosate or Roundup really falls into this very same category, not only you know, for most people hearing this, they sort of think about if they've got a home where they bought weed killer to, you know, pretty up their yard, or whatever happens to be, or maybe they've got something on their driveway they're trying to kill. You know, they, they think of buying, you know, Roundup and spraying it in their driveway or their yard. But the real burden of glyphosate comes from its use of utilization in the farming community. I mean, that the, the vast majority of where glyphosate comes from 
and makes it into our um, ecosystem is coming from commercial farming. And, and nowadays, we just simply can't get away from it, right? It's, it's in our lawns, it's, it's in our soil, whether you're living in the Midwest or you're living on the East Coast or you're living on the West Coast, it's just pervasive in that regard. It's in the soil, in your backyard garden, it's in the parks where your kids play because it's been utilized for so long, uh, farming community. And then, and then finally, really what happens here is that it goes off and becomes a part of the ecosystem of water, right? Whether that's streams or rivers, eventually to the ocean, all the way to the point where it can be detected in the rain. And so now it's pervasive in all aspects of our society. So much so that if you were to take a, a box of Honey Nut Cheerios, and some of you may have actually seen this example, it's really quite startling for me, the levels of glycosate in it are high enough that they actually could show up on the nutritional facts panel. So obviously that is not a nutritional ingredient that anybody uh, wants uh, in their diet, particularly when you think about um, something like Honey Nut Cheerios, and there's plenty of adults that eat Honey Nut Cheerios, but in general, uh, a cereal like this is something for kids when their livers, their kidneys, their hearts, their lungs, their little bodies are just not yet as seasoned or as toughened, say, as, as, our, as adults. I'm 56 years old, so I, you know, I've, I've got some mileage on things, and so I, I can probably handle something like this a little more, but kids can't, right? And so you, you, you wonder the role that's playing in this increased risk that we have relative to degenerative diseases or mental health issues. You know, what, what role are all these chemicals playing? Of course, it's nearly impossible to think about how we would fully study that kind of issue, except to say this, I think we all know given a choice, right? If you've got a spoonful of cereal, on the one hand, it's organically sourced, and so we know it's free of these chemicals through testing and certification. On the other hand, it's, it's commercial, and we know there's a little bit of glycosate in there. Even if the science says, scientist says to you, hey, it's not that much, it's not that big a deal, I think we all know what choice we're gonna make, right? None of us knowingly want to consume something like this. And while we've villainized glycosate, I mean, frankly, there's countless other dozens of chemicals that really fit into this same category. So. As consumers, I think it's very important that we express ourselves. Of course, you can express yourself with lobbying and, and letter writing and things like this. We're a part of the Organic Trade Association. So, you know, we attend in DC the, the conference in July where you know trying to talk to lawmakers, you're you're trying to get them to you know, pay attention to these issues. But frankly, it's a it's a strong headwind. You know, the the commercial interests, what I call big agro big food, you can kind of set them side by side with big pharma, they have so many dollars. Um, their size and their scope is so overwhelming to something like the Organic Trade Association or other lobbying groups that would be sort of fighting uh, these kinds of issues that my perspective is that if you want to affect this, it's got to come from us individually and how we vote with our dollars. Um, if, you, if you look today at something like organic foods, now the cost of those compared to say conventionally prepared foods, so, so let's say potato chips in the store, and I'm, I'm not advocating potato chips, but let's just use that example as a snack food. Uh, organic potato chips versus conventional potato chips, well the cost differential now is below 3%, and in some cases it gets close to 1% according to the research. The challenge is in grocery stores, uh, the space with which that is displayed is actually purchased. It's, it's really quite like real estate. And so whether it's Lay's or other big multinationals that own that space, they've positioned their products in such a way that the consumer's got to go out of their way to another nearly obscure part of the store to find snack foods or other items that are qualified and certified organic, even though uh, the pricing gap has really closed down. So consumer awareness, uh, advocating for yourself, advocating for your family, this is the kind of things that we think are, are critical because it's just everywhere. And then of course there's GMOs and I'm, I can't imagine I'll be the only speaker in this series that will talk about genetically uh, modified uh, foods. 
But if you look at the adoption rates, it's just really staggering. When we talk about corn, soy, cotton, you know, you're talking 90 plus percent of corn produced, soy produced, cotton produced. And where that affects us from a food standpoint is cotton seed oil that is utilized as an ingredient in uh, numerous uh, packaged foods. Well, now that genetically modified material is in that food supply. And in fact, if you, you know, go into your pantry, you're going to find this. Now, I'll, I'll give you some label tips here before the presentation is over. But when we talk about GMOs, I, I find sometimes people aren't really certain about, okay, what are we talking about here that's concerning? And number one is that they're genetically modified to be herbicidal tolerant. So that essentially means that the farmer, um, if he's using this genetically modified seed, um, plants the crop, he can go in there and spray loosely, aggressively, uh, the glycosphate, uh, the glycosphenate, or the dicamba. Big, big battles right now uh, about dicamba, and, and particularly there because uh, they kill bees. Uh, the one thing we know about this ongoing, really what I would call a crisis with what's happening with our, our bee community. And as the health of the bees go, so does the health of the fruits and vegetables and produce that we have. And it's one of those things that we, we just cannot afford to ignore um, this issue. Uh, but the bottom line is their crops are genetically modified so that these uh, herbicides, and they can also do this now with fungicides and pesticides, are not affected by that spraying. So they liberally spray the Roundup to get rid of the problems that they're looking to get rid of. And, and the product then, the crop is safe in that regard. It's not gonna die off on the vine as you would describe it. However, this is where that glyphosate winds up getting into the plant material and ultimately in a commercially um, grown fresh fruits and vegetables, that's where that risk of that glyphosate making it into the end supply, that's how how it wound up in the Honey Nut Cheerios. And then the other one for me that's maybe the most disturbing is that when they genetically modify them, they will modify a gene so that they produce a protein that is essentially insecticidal. So it would cause death um, in the stalk of the corn or whatever happens to be that they're working with so that when the insects eat them, they essentially die. And I just think that brings up all kinds of questions and concerns, you know, so much so that um, at last count, there was a partial ban or a total ban over safety concerns in some 26 different countries. You know, Neil, in the beginning, you said in the U.S. we uh, probably don't have the most stringent rules, and that's true. We don't. Uh, there are plenty of nations around the world that have taken a more cautious approach. I'm not going to pretend that I've got all the answers in this regard, but I think when we're talking about the food supply and the delicacy, uh, or the, the delicate nature of the human body and our organs and these long-term impacts, you know, it concerns me how quickly this stuff gets put in the food supply. And essentially we become an experiment for what the long-term impact of genetically modified foods will be. So if you've got a pen and paper, I'll give you uh, sort of that top 13 to look for when you go to the grocery uh, corn is number one, soy, uh, canola oil, aspartame. If you're, if you're getting things that are artificially sweetened, um, the aspartame is almost certainly uh, going to come from a genetically modified uh, food material, sugar beets. Um, if your supplements that you're buying, I don't care how much you're paying for them. Um, you can be paying a heck of a lot of money and buying it from the best you know, physician or scientist in your town if they are not organically uh, certified, organic based, if it's not a trusted environment, uh, almost certainly uh, that material, and I'll talk about this in detail a little later on, is coming from genetically, uh, most likely genetically modified corn uh, byproducts to make your supplements. And so it's, it's everywhere and it requires a vigilance um, that you know, maybe most of us don't wanna have to pay this much attention, but that's just the reality of what we live in. Ice cream, Gosh, you know, ice cream is great treat, right? Sort of for most people brings a smile and fond memories. Critical issue, uh, a lot of GMOs involved in ice cream, baby formula, unfortunately, papaya. So even pristine Hawaii, you know, the problem is there. Arctic apples and Arctic apples are far more popular. That's not an obscure apple. 
And so it's something to pay attention to. Cottonseed oil, as I mentioned earlier, zucchinis or yellow squashes and potatoes, of course, are a big part of that GMO environment. So vigilance is, is uh, critical and something we all really just have to pay attention to. So I'm gonna take a minute here and uh, move the um, imaging a little bit. So as I mentioned earlier about supplements, one of the things that having been involved in the supplement industry for some 30 years and having a chance almost like the Wizard of Oz environment where I've had a chance to peek behind the curtain and see what things uh, look like. Um, it's uh, for most people, if they really knew where the basic materials were coming from uh, in the multivitamin they're buying or whatever it happens to be, they, they probably wouldn't use it. Uh, they would particularly be concerned if they looked at the factory environment. So ascorbic acid, for example, which can be labeled as vitamin C, but essentially from a common sense standpoint, it is not uh, vitamin C. It, it's one piece of an eight part compound. So it's, you know, it's one molecule of an eight part compound that makes up vitamin C. So when you take ascorbic acid, you know, you're really relying on your body to then uh, use enzymes to break down out of your collagen, the other seven components needed to make a complete structure uh, and turn that into vitamin C. So when scientists or physicians are down on vitamins, uh, it's for good reason. The efficiency of converting something like ascorbic acid into vitamin C is so poor. You have to take these massive amounts. And of course, it just resembles nothing like you might find in vitamin C that you find in nature in an orange or a lemon. That isn't to say that you can't use good whole food sources of vitamin C. And given how few people get enough vitamin C in their, in their diet and the negative health impacts of that, I mean, it's something to pay attention to, but it's, it's a critical issue. So this is really, when you think about supplements, and this is my business, so I've been doing this a long time. There's probably 40 plus billion dollars spent in the US and Canada. 99% uh, of them are being made in the same ways that ultra processed foods are being made. They're derivatives or extracts of genetically modified corn or other ingredients. And so, you know, that's what we're talking about. We talk about the vitamin C, the malodextrin, which is coming from a corn soy, which we've talked about, sucralose, which is an artificial sweetener, but essentially derived from corn. The syrups that you see, the vitamin E is coming from corn oil. So it's just a pervasive component and it's, it's, you got to be relentless. That's what this amounts to is you've got to be tireless and relentless in your own decisions and how you, uh, um, you know, sort of pay attention to your health. And so I, and my imaging here is not moving forward. There we go. So what else do we need to be concerned about? Because we've got some, some sourcing standpoints. Well, the bigger issue to me, even, even beyond that, maybe I shouldn't call it bigger. It's just, it's just all sort of couples to, to, together in that regard is we, we also need to pay attention to uh, food additives and particularly where these food additives can have such a negative impact on the gut. So for a lot of us, if you, if you don't have a, either a biochemistry degree or a little bit of understanding this, what's important to recognize is um, absorption doesn't just take place when you're talking about the absorption of micronutrients. You know, we have a tendency to think, well, it's all happening in my gut. There are some, there's some absorption taking place in your gut, right? You're, you're, you're getting some carbohydrates, fats, and proteins from things you eat in your gut, but primarily in the large intestine and the small intestine is where the bulk of this heavy lifting and work is done, where your body's breaking down food. You know, your body's essentially a juicer. So it's kind of juicing the food, right? And extracting out the micronutrients and the fibers and these things. And so what it's working with though, is going to really have a, a, a dramatic impact on the health of the gut and the bowel. So when you get a lot of refined oils, which are common, you know, oftentimes the, the second or the third ingredient in packaged foods, even dried goods, right? We have a tendency to think, well, if it's not uh, a liquid, then, then I don't have to worry about oils. That, that, that's not true because you can have the oil in a, in a dried state that's a part of the makeup of that product. These refined oils, because of the way they're processed, um, essentially are unrecognizable by your body. You, you don't make enzymes that are designed to break down these oils that have been oxidized and highly heated and perhaps had a hydrogen molecule introduced to them to provide stability. For example, um, when frying oil, 
is made. And, and you know, in a restaurant, you know, they're, they're frying things over and over and over again. They want the oil to last a longer period of time because of the expense of the oil. Well, they'll introduce a hydrogen molecule to that oil to make it more sturdy so that it lasts longer. This is the, where we got trans fats from, right? And for, for those that are, let's say at least my age, in, in their 50s, you remember how margarine was talked about as this great gift to uh, cardiovascular disease in the 60s and 70s because it wasn't the saturated fat that you found in butter. And of course, we later realized that no, these trans fats are far more uh, difficult for the body, far more likely to lead to cardiovascular disease than just getting simple saturated fats from butter, which your body natively has enzymes and structures to break down and at least make either waste out of it or utilize it from a nutritional standpoint. So when we look at food additives, their, their big issue here, whether it's the refined oils, uh, emulsifiers, which are, that gives something structure that shouldn't have structure, right? So if you're if you're eating a snack food and it, it, it doesn't make sense, and I'll, I, I hate to pick on these, but I ate these as a kid, so this is what popped to mind, but uh, bugles. I don't know if anybody in the audience has ever had a bugle, but it was a snack food that, at least where I grew up in North Carolina, was uh, popular in, in the 70s. Well, there's nothing in nature that looks like a bugle, right? As a, as a manufactured, a manufactured shape food, so you use things like emulsifiers to uh, create that, right? artificial sweeteners, even artificial flavors. I probably should have put that as a, a bullet point. And then of course, another ingredient that's an unintended consequence of sort of the modern world are the BPAs because the BPA is coming from the packaging, whether it's the lining of a can, the plastic lining of a can, uh, the lining uh, or the plastic bottle that has the Gatorade or the sodas or whatever happens to be, even the stick packs, I mean, uh, the Gogurt packs, all of these things have ingredients that essentially leach into the food. Well, now, once consumed, just like the glycosate, right? Once it's in your body, your body's got to deal with that. You know, it doesn't just get a free pass to pass through, right? From a cellular standpoint, from a nutritional standpoint, you got to deal with it. Your, your gut's not prepared to. So the, one of these runaway rampant issues people face is leaky gut. And, and of course, that's um, not, not good for us, right? And then we can talk about the artificial sweeteners. I, I think I, I mentioned that a, a few moments ago. This is one of those really tricky issues uh, for people because you've got a lot of folks that for good reason, they're, they're, they're not happy with their weight. Um, it can affect their sleep, quality of life. It can make them unhealthy. Uh, the heavier you are, you're just technically speaking, your, your risk of vascular disease, cancer, diabetes, all these other things really rise, right? So you're, you're trying to pay attention to your weight and you're worried about calories. And so you go for something that's uh, sweetened with artificial sweetener thinking, okay, I won't, I won't get the calories. Here's the problem. These artificial sweeteners affect negatively your appetite hormones. So if you just take GLP-1 or some of the others, adiponectin would be a, another, they can trick them, right? And so the, the, the downstream impact on this is, is, is quite severe. You, you, you taste a sweetness in your mouth. So one of the very first things that your body does is it produces uh, insulin. And that insulin's there. So thinking, okay, I've got some glucose coming into the gut. It's eventually going to flood the bloodstream. And the body's got to now manage that rising glucose level uh, with insulin. It needs the insulin to get the glucose into the cell to create energy or excess amounts of it to be processed. But of course, there's no glucose there. It's an artificial sweetener. So now your body has an excess amount of insulin and it's got to do something with that. So very often it will take what are not carbohydrates, but say proteins and look to turn those into fat actually because the insulin has to do something. And then it can, of course, you know, years, decades of drinking uh, diet sodas, for example, where this process repeats on a, on a daily basis, you can wind up having an enlarged pancreas. Um, all kinds of uh, issues come from that where now your body may produce a lot of insulin, but it's of a low grade. So it's no longer effective at dealing with insulin. And this is sort of one of those complications that leads to vulnerabilities to type 2 diabetes. And so tricking the brain in this regard, not a great idea. And all along the way, um, it's damaging because of the chemical nature of it, the man-made nature of it. It's damaging the good flora in your gut. And any time that you're doing something, whether it's excessive drinking, smoking, ultra-processed food, tons of chemicals, anytime you're doing something that damages the good flora, 
then in your bowel, that flora loses its balance. And so what takes over are bad floras, generally fed by sugars, can create yeast broom, blooms that create all kinds of indigestion, digestive issues, bloating, and can lead to even further problems down the line. So the artificial sweeteners are really tricky. I'll, I'll tell you right up front, not a fan, uh, you know, what, whatsoever. And then of course there's, there's food dyes. And food dyes, you know, I, it is compelling if for food manufacturers, you know, they want to make food look a certain way. But when you look at something, you know, whether it's you go into a convenience store and you see this massive wall in the refrigerator case of all these drinks and they're, they're brightly colored, it may be appealing to the eye, but none of that's natural, right? And all of those chemicals ultimately have to be processed by your liver, you know, by your kidneys. And we now have some reason to believe that this is playing a role in this increased uh, amount of, of food sensitivity that people have, whether we're talking about gluten intolerance or other issues in that range, somewhere between the artificial sweeteners, the food dyes and other additives, right? We're, we're, we're slowly uh, damaging our ability to manage food in a natural state because of all the chemical exposure. So with the blue dyes, you see them uh, in baked goods quite constantly. The green dyes, the fast green particularly, you, you, you find that in cosmetics principally. You've got some countries in Europe where that is completely banned because of the risk they believe with it being associated with being a carcinogenic. And then in the red dyes, you, you see that oftentimes you'll, you'll see those in a variety of places, but it can be used in the casing of sausage and other things to give it a red color that's not really there. There's probably a few that are tuned into us here that remember pink slime from a few years ago where people were buying a ground hamburger that was sort of extraordinarily pink. And then they begin to realize that that's actually an additive, right? It wasn't that that um, ground beef actually maintained that red color on its own. Uh, it was actually brown from age and other issues as they were actually adding something called pink slime. One of the best uh, examples of when consumers get mad and take action, what can happen because pink slime is out of business. Here was a whole industry that were polluting us through ground beef and other applications for that that within a very short period of time, the pressure on these corporations to get that out of the food supply was such that that doesn't even exist anymore. I, I worry what we don't know about what it was replaced with, but it's critical. And then of course, with the yellow dyes, all of these things, you know, for us as adults, right? It can raise issues um, associated with our, our digestive things, a digestive system and our flora and things of this kind, but for kids, you know, this can actually impact dramatically in some adults behavioral issues. And so the food dyes are, are, are worrisome and, and another thing to try to pay attention to. And, and, and one of those reasons why ultra processed food, and I get it, we're, we live in a go-go society. It's just super busy and uh, we hardly have time to stop and eat. And, you know, I, I, look, I, I think most people that pull through a drive through and somebody hands them their meal um, in a styrofoam container, they're under, under no illusions that that's not like grandma's, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables, it's a fuel stop and it's some nuggets for the kids on the way to piano or soccer or whatever happens to be. If it's an occasional situation, you can kind of give your body a chance to manage it. But unfortunately, um, we live in a world, and I, I guess I'll talk a little bit more about this later as well, but you know, probably 95% of the calories being consumed by the average consumer in the U United States, 95% of that's coming from ultra-processed foods. So we're, we just don't give ourselves much of a break or, or much of a chance. And so I, I tell folks, if you're sort of looking for some walk away here, just be careful of food labels. You know, number one, pay attention to food labels. The simpler, the better. The more sort of chemically riddled it is with titles and things, I think that's where the struggle is. But when you see things like fat-free, that's just an automatic signal for artificial sugars. Um, uh, or, or, or basically, you're going to see artificial sugars replaced there and high carbohydrate counts. Same thing with the sugar-free. So fat-free, sugar-free, heart-healthy. Uh, I think heart-healthy, for the most part, when I see these things, is not heart-healthy. Uh, most of the time they're giving themselves that designation because they've limited the amount of fat in the product. 
which may or may not be important depending upon the kind of product that it is. But then they're going to have where they swing on the other side where it's got a ton of sugar. And then sometimes heart healthy means it doesn't have a lot of sodium. Well, that limitation on the sodium just means they're putting some other type of preservative in there if it's a packaged good. So you got to, you got to, I mean, I, I just encourage people that center of the grocery store is really dangerous. And you really want to pay attention to the outer ring where things are less processed to give yourself the very best chance possible. And so let's, let's also look at it from a, from a packaging standpoint. And, and there's no question that the packaging I, I mentioned before that, that BPA and, and the role that placed in, in putting uh, um, those chemicals into the food supply. Well, there's a term and for those of you that want to learn more about this, in, in fact, all of these subjects, if you go over to our website, we've got a blog under the community tab, some really great uh, articles there. We've got some really dedicated, uh, committed, serious health people that write some nice articles for us about the subject matter to provide education to consumers. But there's a term now that's becoming more and more popular called obesogens. And obesogens are essentially these man-made toxins that are messing with your body and making it nearly impossible for people to lose weight. And I, I imagine there's folks on this uh, webinar with us here that, you know, you're giving it all the good effort, right? You're, you're, you're doing the exercise, you're trying to get to sleep, you're, you're, you're drinking the water, you're paying attention to the food that you eat, but you don't seem to be able to make the dent that your efforts suggest you should be able to. Well, that's because these obesogens, and I'll give you the sources here in just a minute, they negatively impact and slow your metabolism. At the same time, a very insidious component is when they mess with the hormonal structure, um, your thyroid and other things, they actually can make you more hungry. And so someone says, gosh, I, I didn't used to be hungry in between meals until I started trying to lose weight, right? And, and now all of a sudden you find yourself, I can't, I can't, I can't take it. I can't go from breakfast to lunch, right? I've got a snack in between. And generally when people are snacking, they're not snacking on the best stuff. And we consider ourselves, well, I'm gonna keep a bag of, of uh, carrots and, a, and celery in my desk drawer. But the truth is we tend to go for things that are convenient. And, and so that snacking can get in the way. So the combination of slowing metabolism, causing people to be more hungry than they should be, right? Because there's a false signal going to the brain uh, craving them the unhealthy foods. And, and so here's, here's where this next part goes. Instead of then burning through your efforts to increase your metabolism, exercise, and lose weight, instead of burning and, and reducing the size and structure of these fat cells, these obesogens actually increase the size of fat cells and increase the production of fat cells. So obviously, uh, completely opposite of what we're trying to accomplish. And so where do these obesogens come from? Well, you've got the BPAs and the BPSs, plastic water bottles, plastic food wrappers. Uh, I'm really leery. I try to tell my kids all the time, man, don't be careful that you're buying food that's covered in cellophane or other types of plastics, even in your house, right? If you can uh, buy glass storage containers, you're just far better off to do that from a health standpoint. If you are going to use plastic, whatever you do, don't heat things up in plastic. Don't, don't stick something that's cold in the fridge, in the microwave, in a plastic container. You're just sort of inviting this uh, series of chemicals to leach into the food that you're about to eat. Phylates, which are also fall into this category. I wish I could remember the name of a movie. There's a movie, uh, a nationally uh, popular sort of Hollywood movie coming out uh, real soon here, talking about phylates and their impact of health. I guess I, Maybe you can't remember the actor's name that's going to be in it, but to, once it's out and advertised, you'll, you'll maybe remember this moment. But phylates you find in flooring, cosmetics, and food packaging, they essentially take vinyl and give it a malleable structure, make it flexible. Unfortunately, it leaches into uh, almost everything it touches, right? It gets into our supply. I mean, literally, kids are playing on uh, that vinyl flooring, and just like when kids played with lead, in paint around window seals, it winds up getting into their body. You'll often find these phylates in children's toys that they're um, teething on or eating or using. And even for us as adults that we're just touching, flame retardant materials. And boy, what a, 
what a challenging issue to think about, right? I mean, we, we certainly see the value of flame retardant materials, but the downside of this is they never go away. Once they get into your system, they're just there forever. I have flown a lot in my life. I've got a couple million miles on, uh, of airline miles. And so I've, I've been in these planes where essentially everything you touch in a plane is coated in flame retardant material, right? One of the safety measures from from early uh, decades ago when they learned about plane crashes was to coat them with flame retardant material. But, so whether it's the overhead bend or when you sit down in the seat and, and, and the weight of your body compresses the, the foam cushion and now it atomizes up into air, those chemicals as they begin to break down in structure, not fall apart, just become smaller in terms of their structure or even mattresses or carpet. I was uh, really hearkened to see uh, released by uh, Lowe's Home Improvement um, that they will no longer beginning next spring carry uh, carpets that are treated with flame retardant material. So a start, right? But it's going to come with consumers voting with their dollars because once these flame retardants are in your body, and if you've flown as much as I have, you know, I'm, I'm sure my body would burn, but it wouldn't burn easily uh, given all the uh, flame retardant material I've been exposed to. And then of course the nonstick cookware. So you're, you're, you're talking about Teflon coated pots and pans which are so convenient, right? I mean, it's compelling for us as consumers to want to be able to use a product like that, a tool like that in the kitchen. But uh, these nonstick cookwares with all that Teflon, they have those PFOSs in there and they're just, they're just bad for us. Even microwave popcorn. If you are a fan of microwave popcorn, it's so convenient, smells so good, right? A lot of people do. Pay attention to your sourcing because you just don't want to have that exposure. So where does all this lead to? Well, ultimately this creates a body burden. And one of the ways I think about it is I think about it almost like an automobile. You know, on an automobile, you've got an oil filter, you know, you've got an air filter, and as a part of maintenance to keep your car running for 100,000 miles or, you know, whatever the suggestion is, you know, you're changing not just the oil, but the oil filter, you're changing the air filter because you want to, you know, have it be clean what's going into the automobile to make it last longer. We're the same way. We don't think about it as much. And unfortunately, we don't have the ability to just change out the parts and pieces. You know, if you, you think about your home, for anybody that lives in an environment where you've got a central heating and air conditioning system, then you've got some place in your house where there's an air filter. And that air filter is gonna be, you know, box size, right, large square. And there's gonna be a filter there. And that filter is actually the filter that's filtering the air that's brought in from the house, in, in from the interior house, uh, comes, it, it's being sucked through the filter into your heat, uh, the duct system, and eventually going into the air handler. So whether it's an AC system or for heat, well, it's filtering the air that's in your home. So when you, when you change that filter, right, if you let 90 days pass before you change your filter, or Sometimes you forget, right, it's six months or whatever, and you go to it, and, and you open up the grate, and you look at it, it's, it's dirty, right? It's like, oh my God, I, you know, it's nasty. I don't want to touch it. That dust is there. Just remember, you live, on, you live on the dust side. You don't live on the back side. That filter is as much there to protect the mechanical components of your air handler as it is anything else. And so our air is dirty, and the more tightly constructed your home which is, which is modern construction, right, for heat loss and insulation and things like this, then the more that recirculation of this air occurs, and so you're, you're living on the front side of that. So what that filter breathed, you did as well. And so your lungs have to manage that same type of toxic load, setting aside what we eat and drink or what, what might be coming from touch. And, you know, we don't have the luxury of pulling our lungs out and washing them off. I mean, if you bought a durable filter, you can actually pull it out, wash it off, put it back in. Most people are buying disposables. Our lungs aren't disposable, right? Our kidney, our liver, not disposable. And so we're, we have this body burden that's accumulated over time. And so, you know, it's not unusual to know or learn that this becomes a component uh, for all of these kinds of issues that I've been describing here by the time a person gets into their mid 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, this cumulative effect of these toxins, whether it's coming from the food, the water supply, airborne, and the accumulation in the body. So detox, thinking about it from a personal habit standpoint, 
I think is critical if you're looking to optimize your health because at the end of the day, all these other things which affect us, but I don't believe cumulatively as much as sort of this issue associated with heavy metals. Heavy metals are this great disruptor. You know, whether we're talking about arsenic, uh, which can affect brain function, heart function, um, even lead to skin issues, mercury. I, I imagine this is an aware audience that's tuned into this type of uh, seminar. So clearly you're going to have an understanding of the negative impact of, of mercury. You know, we tend to only think about mercury as it relates to our, the fillings in our mouth. But of course the exposure is, is far greater because of the way it's used in industrial processes, such as things you find with say uh, uh, fluorescent lights or, or, or the kind. And, and that can have a negative impact on your, on your brain in the same way that we think of with lead. So, you know, lead rightfully, you know, we villainize lead and realize two principal places we were being exposed to lead that we needed to pay attention to. One was gasoline. So that minute we were able to really digest in the 70s that we needed to get lead out of gasoline because essentially that burning process of the combustible engine was spewing that lead particles into the atmosphere, particularly in industrial cities, we see concentration, lack of air movement really have a negative impact. We know that lead has a negative impact on, on brain function, can even lower IQ. We know kids that have been exposed to paint chips, right, perform uh, worse on IQ, intellectual property testing uh, inside their home. Even their ability to govern behavior, right, whether we're talking about just simple keeping of time, managing emotions, you know, what we call this sort of personal governance can be diminished if, if you have sort of been impacted negatively, mercury and lead because of its impact on, on brain function, right? So same thing is true with, uh, with aluminum, chromium. Chromium, just incredibly insidious. We all know the Aaron Brockovich story, which is an aspect of chromium that was found, you know, just really, uh, it's, it's an issue we deal with. And of course, cadmium, you know, we principally, cigarette smokers and then the, and then the secondhand smoke, uh, automobile pollution. So anybody stuck in traffic, particularly if there's an older car in front of you and can really smell uh, the exhaust emissions, a lot of that is, is the cadmium. So these, these heavy metals um, wreak havoc on the body. And, and it's, it's, it's interesting to look at it. Is it just the exposure to the heavy metals uh, coming from the environment? It's also the fact that if you have an unhealthy diet, right? So let's take, for example, my discussion of, of um, ultra processed foods, which don't have a lot of micronutrients in them, don't have those basic minerals that you're looking for. The body will actually use heavy metals in place of good minerals if they're absent from your diet. And so one of the things that can happen with lead or even aluminum is it can be utilized in your bone structure and people get literally brittle bones because these heavy metals aren't supposed to be there and it can destroy the structure. So we have historic information available for people that worked in uh, lead uh, smelting environments where their exposure was so constant people didn't know any better. It's kind of like the Mad Hatters back in the day uh, where they were exposed to, to chromium and other things. And so these things can have real serious consequences even in very, very small levels. So Here's a, a couple of things to think about. i give you sort of my, my top seven things to pay attention to. Uh, neurotoxics, uh, which will not just damage, but kill uh, nerve endings and brain cells. If you find that you've got poor memory issues, you know, you, you've got mood issues that aren't explained, you know, for, for no particular reason, right? Your, your mood swings aren't appropriate and you know that then you need to pay attention to and look at, okay, what am I being exposed to that maybe I don't realize because very often these things, you can't smell them and you certainly can't see them because they're so small. IQ issues, uh, executive function, uh, where you're just not able to keep pace in a way that you think you should. If you find my, fine motor skills are deteriorated in a way that doesn't make sense to you. Uh, so all of these things are, are, are really critical. And of course, cardiovascular diseases may be the most visible because heavy metals, damage um, cardiac function, particularly when we talk about arsium, ar arsenic, excuse me, uh, cadmium and lead, these are kind of the bigger culprits. Uh, they contribute to oxidative stress. So we I imagine most on this call, you know, you hear about antioxidants and fresh fruits and vegetables, particularly if they're uh, deeper in their colors, those are extremely powerful in that regard. 
Well, that oxidative stress, um, essentially coming from free radical damage, that's all, you know, you, you create oxidative stress when you breathe. You know, the metabolism, metabolization of oxygen in your lungs will create oxidative stress. Your body's built and designed to manage that. And there's a certain amount of oxidative stress that's okay. It's, a, it's, it's sort of a part of the functionality of the body. But when it's introduced from outside sources in excessive amounts, now this oxidative stress really can't be arrested or managed by the body. So it can begin to damage cardiac output, put strain on the glutathione levels in the body. And so this is where antioxidants, having a diet that's richer in, in deep leafy green vegetables, uh, deeply colored fruits is in, important to sort of counteract the impact of these heavy metals that are common in our society. It creates inflammation. Imagine most people here that do any kind of reading, uh, reading about cardiovascular disease recognize that inflammation is a terrible culprit, culprit in making us more vulnerable to degenerative to disease. And, and it's interesting, and it, it isn't just that it can incite cardiac event, it also can lead up to cardiac events because you're far more likely to have a hardening of the arteries or the accumulation of the plaques if you're dealing with a constant uh, amount of inflammation in your bloodstream. This even, we now know, plays a role in your risk of cancer. So inflammation is to be managed. And of course, if you're dealing with these environmental pollutants from toxic foods, that's not easy to do so. And so a high blood pressure then becomes this next part of it because one of the things that occurs is your blood vessel walls become stiff. And so, so to give you an idea of how to think about things, when the heart's pumping properly, um, at the bottom of the heart, that large uh, aorta, the, the, the big vessels there, when the heart pumps, they should expand, right? And think about how uh, a soft, rubbery, a water hose, you know, in the summertime, warm temperatures might expand, right, when something pumps through it. But if you think about it in the wintertime, when a piece of rubber is cold and brittle, of course, it's not going to expand like it's supposed to. And as you get older, you're going to have a natural amount of stiffness that occurs. But the more you've been exposed to these toxins, the less work you've done to try to counteract that with your habits and how you eat. And then the stiffer those blood vessels are as the heart pumping action occurs, and they should expand, well, what happens then is they don't expand, and so it creates this high blood pressure because the heart has to work harder. Well, then your heart enlarges, which is not what you want to occur, becomes uh, less efficient, and so it, your risk of a heart attack becomes greater. The stiffening of the arteries because they don't handle things properly, don't move blood properly, and all of this is sort of these symptomatic issues of not just ultra-processed food, but exposure to toxins in food, and so I I tell people, like, listen, if you if you find yourself fatigued in ways you shouldn't be, uh, you've got autoimmune issues that maybe you and your doctor can't completely figure out what's going on, which can show up in the form of, of skin uh, difficulties, unexplained rashes and things of this kind. Uh, going back to just the slide before, we were talking about um, difficulty concentrating, uh, headaches, trouble with weight, sleep problems. These are all the symptoms that toxicity is something that you should be concerned about and paying attention to. And so I'll, I'll give you some of the ways that, that I, I believe you should sort of deal with this. And the first one is, of all the things I've talked about, if any of it resonates with you, if you're keeping a little list here of things to try to pay attention to, um, we don't wanna be a fast food nation. It's not a compliment. You know, I, I realize our fast food in this country is unique because it's driven down the total cost of food and the world's expensive, and, and, and so there's, there's some interest in that in trying to control food. We do a lot of, on the political side, a lot of subsidizing of corn and things of this kind that you know, sort of contribute to these issues. But in this case, these ultra-processed foods that public corporations have driven their production costs down so far, you know, if, you're, if you're buying two large hamburgers for two bucks or whatever these deals are, just think about what the food cost must actually be there, right? It must be pennies. Well, how is something grown? How's a farmer paid? How's a processor paid? How's a baker paid? How, how are all these people paid if there's just pennies there, right? They, they can't be paid a whole lot. So what's then sacrificed is the quality of the ingredients that make up this fast food. And one of the things that we know occurs is that they really are devoid of basic micronutrients that are 
you know, what your body needs for fundamental survival. So if you're making a list of things to pay attention to, and I'm not, I'm not trying to lecture, this is all about just observation and, and just the stats and facts and things that are out there. Um, anything you can do to reduce your, your intake of ultra processed foods to something that's manageable, certainly not letting it be 95% of what you do is a great idea. Buying organic. Buying organic really matters. It matters for several reasons. And I'll, I'll give you one from a community standpoint. The, the one thing that's sort of lost in our discussion about toxicity is we're thinking about how it affects us, right? I, I think about myself, my wife, Maria, the kids, Sawyer and Ethan. I, I think about it from that standpoint. But what I also need to think about is those farm workers, you know, that are handling those conventionally grown products that aren't washed in the field, right? And so they're harvesting with masks on and gloves, we hope, right? But that's not always the case. You're talking about where labor has tried to be minimized in such a way, we'd probably all be disturbed if we knew actually what kind of wage was going into the person helping to pick and harvest the foods that we're eating, right? And then it's also the local water supply. You know, one of the things that's occurring that we see is how it impacts, say, a school a local elementary school where now no longer they want the kids to drink from the water fountain because of all the runoff and how it's gotten into the groundwater supply and it's made it into the municipal water supply, right? So when you vote with your dollars and buy something like organic, and if I sound like I'm trying to be an advocate of organic, I am, I am, I truly, truly am. I believe for our society, there's a lot of very positive things that come from that. One is if we can put value on it, then you'll have more people growing um, sustainable farming practices, which are part of organic. Uh, they'll be using less chemicals that will then make it into the, you know, less chemicals in the soil, less into the stream runoff, less into the community where your stuff is grown, less concern about the farm workers that are picking that. So just remember that there's a broad picture here, even before this wonderful food can arrive to your table for you and your family to eat. And so I think that's important. Organic has been shown to be higher in nutritional value, more antioxidants, right? So we talk about oxidative stress and other things. You want those antioxidants in your diet. Uh, far fewer heavy metals, not zero. You know, we, we, we can't confuse that issue. You, you still have things where you've got commercial growers and organic growers sharing space and air. And so it's just about best practices and trying to do the best we can. Uh, you, you tend to see inorganic cleaner ingredients across the board. It's not always true. And far fewer toxins from pesticides, herbicides, uh, fungicides, uh, herbicides, so all these things. And so essentially it lowers your risk of exposure. And there was, I'll, I'll just point this out. People are like, well, is there any evidence to support this? It's a very large study done in France uh, over a long period of time, just reported about a year ago, close to 70,000 people uh, were tracked in basically studying their buying habits. And what they found was that those individuals that reported to and were able to demonstrate with sort of receipts and things they were doing that were buying a higher percentage of their food as organic as opposed to conventional, that group of people were 25% less likely to develop cancer. So we, we've got to be careful in overanalyzing this type of conclusion um, you know, we want to pay attention to the data and the fundamentals here, but it's just practical to think if I can reduce my exposure, however I accomplish that, you know, my risk of degenerative disease should be less, right? And that's fundamentally what we can learn from some of these longitudinal studies that are out there. Um, paying attention to things in your pantry, like I've spoken about. So um, GMO uh, laced ingredients, whether it's citric acid or the, the MSG, I, I think most people sort of understand the the issues associated with uh, monosodium glutamate, but it's there, it's real. And here's unfortunately, when you're buying packaged goods, if you're not spinning the label uh, to pay attention, you're gonna find that it's just socked with this kind of stuff. And almost all corn syrup, unless it's coming from organically uh, certified product, uh, corn syrup and corn starch is most certainly going to come from a GMO product. And so we're gonna have to, to deal with those issues along the way. And then finally, uh, supplements. And so make sure that when you, buy supplements. And I'm an advocate of supplements. The one thing I recognize and, and part of my, you know, involvement and reason for, for being involved in this industry is that, you know, we supplement because we live this uh, hurried, go-go modern lifestyle where we hardly have time to think 
uh, most of us, you've generally got both adults in a household that are working. And so food prep time isn't quite what we need it to be. And, and, and in fact, I think it's interesting, this, this lifestyle, people, people look for common sense solutions, right? Because I think that's one of the reasons why juicing has become so popular. The, the challenge with that is there is a heck of a lot of uh, prep involved with juicing, right? The, the shopping, the cleaning, the chopping, then the juicer, right? Which isn't inexpensive. Um, and then you got to clean the juicer. Uh, and then you got to learn how to do a recipe or the thing's going to taste bad, right? And so people are on the right track when they think of these things. It just turns out most people get into juicing and 30 days later, they're not into juicing, right? It's too, it's too much work. They kind of throw in the towel. Supplementing is important because it can help us bridge the gap between where we are and where we want to be. But pay attention to your supplements so that they're not like the ultra processed foods that you're trying to avoid. Look for things that talk about organic practices, organic labels, uh, organic ingredients. Uh, look for things that are unrecognizable, right? If you see something ingredient panel that doesn't make sense to you, ask questions, right? Consumer be aware. You, 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 things like ascorbic acid, sucralose, uh, some of these vitamins, the fillers and the binders are just, they're not what you need and they're not helping your cause. And so the last thing, and I'll, I'll begin to wrap this up, Neil, and I think you may have some questions. So I'm happy to do that. Here's, here's sort of the recipe uh, that I have. One, drink as much good, clean, clear water as you can. If you're kind of stuck on sodas, uh, can you reduce your intake, right? What can you do to reduce your intake of, of liquids that are artificial? I mean, bottom line, you know, can you drink organic coffee without putting stuff in it, teas, things of that kind. Look for places where you can replace these artificial beverages with things that are natural. Water, though, is the best choice. Uh, focus on sleep. You know, the body's amazing, and it can repair, and it can help to get rid of some of these toxins. You have some wonderful uh, mechanisms uh, in your body. It's, it's, it's brilliant in what it can accomplish, but it needs rest, right? So it needs fuel. It needs, it needs water. It needs rest um, as much as you can do, and you might even be tired of me saying it right now, but as much as you can do to avoid the ultra processed foods, I think that's critical. You can limit that intake of sugar, also important. Alcohol within reason, uh, excess there just puts so much stress on the liver, even the kidneys, depending upon what you're drinking. Um, antioxidant rich foods, more color the better, the less processed the better. Movement. Whatever you can do to move. If, you, if you're into going to the gym, go to the gym. But if it just means a couple five minute walks a day, 20 minute walks a day, anything you can do to move your body. And then the last thing I'll mention is the use of a natural mineral called a zeolite. I was introduced to zeolites, boy, night 2005. So my, my history with them is, is uh, coming up on uh, close, to, close to 15 years. Zeolites are this amazing um, natural mineral that has the ability to support and aid the body's ability to detox. And that's whether we're talking about uh, heavy metals and environmental pollutants or support detoxing with volatile organics. It just has a number of, of, of qualities um, that can support your body's ability to detox for myself. It, you know, I see its function being, the, in a way, how we think of the function of a chelating agent, except in this case, it's easy to use on a personal basis, and we don't have to think about sort of those kind of extreme exercises to go through a chelation therapy. It's referred to generally as a master detoxifier, and that's because the scope of it is, is uh, so broad. Now, I've got a couple diagrams I can show you here. It, uh, when, when using a proper zeolite, and there's a qualifier there that I'll explain, but when using a proper zeolite, it can help to alkalize the body and help to better control the pH. And if you've got a lot of exposure to these ultra processed foods, then it's likely that your body's acidic. And an acidic body is a body that's vulnerable to disease, right? So you're looking to try to alkalize the body as much as possible. One of the reasons why greens uh, are so important for good health practices because they help to likewise alkalize the body. Uh, zeolites help to support the gut because they trap in their cages these heavy metals that can be so damaging. Uh, we know that the reducing that body burden of these heavy metals will improve uh, uh, not just mood, but in general, people talk about energy and concentration levels, uh, strengthen the immune system. Anytime you can get this pollutants out of the body's way, your immune system is going to function better. And so um, 
sort of the last piece of it is it supports the growth of good uh, microbes in the body. So zeolites are important. We as a company, Full Transparency, uh, we sell and market zeolite products. It's something that we feel like we're experts in the marketplace. We believe deeply in it. We've got a, a couple of products in this category, but the most important product that we have is our Pure Body Extra Strength. Pure Body Extra Strength is a nano-sized zeolite. And in fact, if you had it, or maybe some of you have tried this before, it's, it's easy to administer or use because it's odorless and tasteless. And so it's just a couple squirts in your mouth uh, two or three times per day. But what zeolites have been shown to do very specifically in the research, and of course, if you go to our site, you can read to your heart's content on quite a bit of research in this regard, but helping to support the body in removing uh, mercury, lead, cadmium, uh, the BPAs, arsenic, aluminum, nitrosamines. We didn't even get a chance to talk about nitrosamines and their negative impacts on brain function, benzenes, pesticides, herbicides, even radioactive material. Great history of zeolites being used with people with excess, excess exposure to radiation and all kinds of other heavy metals. So it's just a very uh, positive product in terms of its ability to support the body. Complementary, we have a philosophy at our, in our organization of you know, take the bad stuff out so you can begin to put the good stuff in. And we think this is a complementary approach. So that's our pure body uh, extra strength. It's really a cellular detox. So as a nano sized particle, so here's, here's a couple of things that are important. So zeolites, for those that are curious about the science, engage in an ion exchange. Uh, they have a natural cage that contains a negative charge and it makes them attracted to positively charged heavy metals and environmental pollutants. So you can kind of think about if you ever played with magnets as a kid, if you've got the north end of a magnet, the south end of the magnet, they kind of snap together. This is exactly what happens, except in this case, it's creating an ion exchange. And so in the same way that an antioxidant helps to neutralize a free radical with an ion exchange, uh, when we talk about that aspect of health and, and nutrition, the very same thing is occurring here, except in this case, our zeolites are flooded with uh, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and it's giving up that unpreferred mineral for things like cadmium, lead, mercury, things of this kind. And then there's additional aspects of it. There's a, what's called a, zeo, a, a sandwich effect where the cumulative um, the cumulative amount of zeolite in the body can actually surround and cluster on heavy metals. And even what's, it, it's, it's a theoretical um, uh, view of function, but basically it's called a zeta effect where the inner charge in the zeolite can actually get to the surface and attract to the surface area of the zeolite, these particles. And once attracted to and locked into the zeolite, the body does not retain them. So we know zeolites have been around a long time. I mean, they're their history actually goes back thousands of years and clay eating societies that didn't realize it, but they were eating zeolites that disrupted dysentery or the bacteria is causing dysentery. And so the people that were literally dying from dehydration with dysentery, you know, they, they would have these clay eating societies uh, thousands of years ago and they would find relief. Later on, the Romans were using this clay uh, in their aqueducts and how they were feeding water into their cities and had some of the cleanest water in those unmodern times, right? All coming from these properties associated with the zeolite. So we got a, a tremendous history. And so what we know is that if you reduce the size small enough and our pure body extra is a nano sized particle, you're talking about on, on the scale, uh, it starts out at 0.7 nanometers. So we're, you're, you're talking about smaller than a red blood cell, uh, smaller than your DNA, you're, 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 you're basically getting to it where the cage itself is almost atom size in terms of the pores, right? So in, in, incredibly small. In this case, it's a little bit counterintuitive. The smaller it is, the more surface area it creates. And so you might think of something like, for example, a basketball, which a large sphere, right? That has a certain amount of surface area. But if you were to cut the basketball open and pour, say, BBs inside of it, the collective surface area of all those BBs inside the basketball, even though they were in the same space, would be greater than the surface area of the basketball. That's what happens when you properly nano-size this product. So we have a process where we clean and prepare the zeolite and nano-size it, and that's what's giving us such extraordinary results is this surface area introduced to the body to support the body's own detoxification. It, it travels through aquaprenas into the cell, so those 70 plus trillion cells in your body 
uh, likewise have a chance to be cleaned. And so it creates really a whole body uh, detox. You combine this, I'll, this is the guarantee I'll give you. Of course, everything we have is guaranteed. This is a guarantee I'll give you. You're drinking clean water, paying attention to your sleep, exercising, pushing away as much as you can from these ultra processed foods and getting some greens, things like that in your diet, you're gonna feel better and your body will better support you and your habits. And so um, the consequences of the modern diet, you don't have to be a victim of it. It's impossible to think you can avoid all the issues associated, but you don't have to be a victim of it. And of course you can, um, there's just a lot you can do to support your health and your family's health. The last thing I'll leave you on, this is really my first opportunity to, to work with Neil and so impressed when I uh, looked at the website and you know, saw what was happening and, and his mission to educate people. We likewise have a mission. Uh, we are committed to impacting 1 million families around the globe with these good health habits and good things we can do it. So for this group that's watching, what I told Neil I would do is I would set aside 500 bottles of this product to the first 500 people that want to look at this. The website's on here and I think maybe Neil will make that available. This is a product normally at retail sells for uh, $79.95, but no strings attached. Uh, we'll give you your first bottle for $5 if you're in the U.S., that will come with free shipping. And of course, even your $5, everything's 100% money back guaranteed, but we'll hope you'll take a look at it. For those of you that are struggling with some issues that we've talked about, I, I think you'll be impressed with uh, how this serves you. So Neil, I, I hope I stayed within our allotted time there and get, and get a little in energized by this discussion. And so I appreciate the chance and my apologies for some of the uh, technical issues there in the beginning. Oh, no worries, man. Thank you so much. That's, uh, this was exactly what I was looking for. Uh, There's a lot of information here um, and you're really informing people of what they can actually do to make these changes in their life, you know, so I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, happy to. And I don't know if you have any questions, but I certainly, uh, people can easily find a way to get in touch with me, but anytime I can support people in understanding these issues even deeper, I'm happy to. Yeah, well, I think, um, you, you explained everything so well, so I pretty much have a really good idea of what you're talking about. But I would love to, in the future, pick specific topics and maybe even go deeper and provide people with a constant, you know, information because it really goes deep. And it, within the conscious community that, like, we're connected to and that you see the kind of events we have on our website, um, a lot of people know about this, but they don't really know how to implement it or how deep the rabbit hole goes and how like you're being bombarded from every single level of these talks talks like even not not just like physical matter but the fact that we exist in a realm of frequencies and there's hundreds of thousands of millions of frequencies going through us all the time there uh, and a lot of them aren't harmonic for our bodies right so we need to, and a lot of these um, products actually assist us with um decalcifying from the radiation from those vibrations as well right yep that's exactly right i you know, and, and for those that are like, oh my gosh, this is overwhelming, just start one place. You know, find, find one place to jump in, right? If, you, if, you're just, if you're drinking too many sodas, try to cut back. I mean, just, just find one place to start because what I find is that once you start to feel better, uh, then the rest of it comes easier, right? And we'll be happy to participate with providing just the layers and layers of additional information. Right, you know, when, um, just to comment on the diet soda thing that you said originally, um, um, a little while ago about how it affects your horm hormones and um, your body makeup. And then later, I think you were saying like later you could have like, you could be overweight and it could actually be because of, you know, you've been taking this thing that's blocking your ability to lose weight. And when I see people drinking diet soda, at, like anywhere in a restaurant, I literally want it because I know that they're drinking it because they want to be healthy. That the only reason you drink diet soda, there's a few people that drink it because they love the taste, right? Right, that's exactly right. They but I want to say something, and I don't know what to say. Yeah, no, I'm with you, you know, and I and I I grew up. Uh, I was in college from '82 to '86, and I just clearly remember people that would drink six, eight diet cokes, diet Pepsi's per day, and they just didn't know any better. And what they were thinking was, well, I'm not getting all the calories from the sugary drink. Yeah. Just not realizing these longer term impacts. And so I, I, I think we're wiser today, but it's certainly, uh, I still see plenty of people with the big gulps and they're probably not containing water. And so it's still, we, we got to keep uh, vigilant and trying to educate people. Yeah, exactly, man. Eddie, thank you so much, brother. I really appreciate this. And I'm glad that we're connected. Uh, and everybody, we're going to, we are offering Eddie's products from the good inside not only do we have an affiliate account there that he's, he's showing you the link right here, but we're also going to just be offering them on our website 
and redirecting them in our shop when we create our own shop, Portal to Ascension. We're going to have an Ascension shop pretty soon, which is basically going to include all products that we can think of that can assist in physical, emotional, spiritual ascension. So thank you, Eddie. I appreciate you, brother. That's great. Thank you so much. And thank you for those that stayed with us in the presentation.